1 Samuel chapter 28. Verse 6. 1 Samuel 28, verse 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either, either by dreams, or by Urim, or by the prophets. Let's pray. Father, I just ask that your word speak to us this morning. That your word does what it's supposed to do in our hearts, Lord. Change us, Lord. Strengthen us, edify us, encourage us, and at times even admonish us for your glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You can all be seated. <coughs> so, if I was to name the sermon this morning, I would title it, The Point of No Return. Uh, it really is a miracle that by the grace and the mercy of God, that He has been so patiently walking with us in this journey. God has been so patiently uh, applied to the hearts of us believers uh, who were once separated by Him. He, he has just been so good to us. Why does, and we would ask the question, why does an omnipotent God tarry so? Why does He wait? Why is He waiting for the fallen sons of Adam and the fallen daughters of Eve as they wallow sometimes joyfully in the sins of this world. Why such long suffering from the great sovereign one who created us for so much more than what we realize on most days? How could God be so tolerant of you and I? And I think it has a lot to do with God is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. But I believe there does come a time when God is done. Our rebelliousness and refusal to repent or to be reconciled and restored to the living God, it brings judgment. It brings a point of no return. I, I won't forget a, a pastor's wife many years ago. Uh, we were talking about salvation and she said, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that my father was saved. I'm confident that my father knew what he was called to in this life. But he kept on denying it and kept on rebelling against God. And God just had enough of it and took him home. And today we'll note three things about Saul in our text. We'll note that first thing, Saul is desperate. Saul is desperate. The second thing. Saul is distracted and deceived. Saul is distracted and deceived. And then lastly, Saul is despondent. Saul is despondent. So the first, the first part of our text, Saul is desperate. Verses 3 through 7 of chapter 28. Now as we begin to address uh, verses 1 and 2 at the very beginning, and it's, we're, we're going to address this a little bit before the main portion of our of our uh, sermon this morning. And realistically, verses 1 and 2 could have been addressed with chapter 27. See, the results of chapter 27 are what put David in the position that he is in now in verses 1 and 2. The forces of the Philistines are, are gathering once again to fight Israel. And Achish, uh, uh, king of Gath, he thinks he has a special weapon. He's got David now. David and his 600 men. Remember, David has slain his, or Saul has slain his thousands and David his 10,000. And probably 10,000 of them is the Philistines. And we look at the conversation in verses 1 and 2. It says, In those days the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, Understand that you and your men are to go out with me in the army. David said to Achish, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. And we have to stop and wonder, okay, what's going on in this conversation? David's a Jew. These are the pagan Philistines. How, can, how does that even go together that he would go fight for the pagan king against his own people? 
Is David really going to fight against God's people, his people? How can he do that? But David, David really, but does David really say he is going out to, with the Philistines to fight Israel? Is that what he really says? And I think what David tells Achish is to temporarily appease him because he has no idea what he's going to do right now. He's been put in this situation and it was almost like, surprise, guess what? And now David doesn't know what he's going to do. He's trying to figure out how to get out of the mess that he's in. And Achish takes it as, yep, now you're going to see what I will do and what my men will do against Saul and his men. Achish even decides that pending the outcome of the battle, David is going to be his personal bodyguard for life. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in chapter 29. But that just kind of whets your appetite a little bit for it. Now let's read verses 3 through 7. It says, Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him, and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor. Saul is in a desperate position now. You ever, you ever been there? You ever been in a position where it's desperate? It's come to that point where you are almost in the throes of despair. He is in the fire now. Now, the fox that chased the rabbit has now become the rabbit. Now it's all on him. Now Saul is in great conflict. So Samuel has been dead since chapter 25. And this plays a significant role as we look through our story. Samuel was the one anointed, Samuel was the one who anointed, who was anointed by Saul. Or Samuel was the one who anointed Saul to be the king. And though Samuel and Saul's was uh, Saul's relationship was severed in this life because of Saul's wickedness, Saul is going to seek him again. And that's just so messed up on so many different levels. Why seek the one he wouldn't listen to in the very beginning? You see what I'm saying? Why would you go and want the advice and want the help of someone that you blew off in the past? Why seek the one who would tell him the truth when Saul very obviously didn't want to know the truth? He'd been told the truth and he disregarded it. Why not just go to the Lord? Why try and find sin? And why not just stop where you're at and say, I need to seek the Lord and the Lord alone. Or why not find the prophet Gad? Why not go and find the priest Abiathar who has the ephod? Why didn't he do these things? And we, see, and we also see that Saul put away all the mediums, all the necromancers. But why? Well, I think there might be two possibilities here. Samuel told him to do it when they were still on good speaking terms. Or he was so tormented by evil spirits that he didn't want any of it in the land of Israel. He didn't want the necromancers. He didn't want the mediums. He didn't want the witches. He didn't want the spirits. He didn't want no part of that because he had been so tormented by them already. He would drive them as far away as he could. Now we come to Saul's conflict. Now the army of the Philistines are all assembled and it's quite impressive. And Israel and Saul, they come forward for the challenge. It says when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. Now, again, why is Saul just now beginning to tremble? You see what I'm saying? All the stuff that's been going on in Saul's life, why is he now 
trembling. He should have been trembling long ago when he rebelled against the words of God's prophet Samuel, when he rebelled against God's uh, words that, that God gave to him, the commands that he gave him, when he rebelled against God. Why, why wasn't he trembling after he did all that? Saul is in the position he is in because of Saul. Nobody did that to Saul. Saul's there because Saul did it. He did it to himself. We go all the way back to chapter 9 and read through, three, and read through to chapter 31, and you will see Saul has no one to blame but Saul. He should be desperate. But he should be desperate for God. Look at what he finally decides to do. And it only took the entire army of the Philistines fit for battle in front of them to make him that vision. Now, it says, first thing is, he inquired of the Lord. Where has this attitude of listening, let alone obeying the Lord, come from? Why is it suddenly he wants to know what the Lord has to say? When, when, when has Saul ever truly inquired of the Lord up to this point? When do we ever see Saul upon his knees seeking the Lord? It's only now that there seems to be any interest in his mind for what the Lord might say about the situation that he is in. See, it took something massive to get Saul to stop. And even think about inquiring of the Lord. See, there's no dreams that the Lord gives him that can help him make a decision. The Lord had given dream, men dreams before to lead them or to inform them. Not Saul. Not now. There was no Urim or Thummim. No Ephod. No priest. For, when, for, for, for whom he could inquire of the Lord. They're gone. And as we see before in chapter 14, he wouldn't listen anyways. Add to that, he killed all of the priestly family but one, Abiathar, and he's with David. And the prophets? Well, there are no prophets to consult. They're probably avoiding him just like David is. Samuel's dead. Gad is with David. And again, he wouldn't listen to him anyways. You, you, you ever experience that with your kids? They come to you and they, they're asking for it and you're going, why am I telling you this? You're not going to listen anyways. Have we, have we not been that way with our Heavenly Father? We've sought Him and the Lord, please tell me, please tell me. And we open up the Word of God and we see what we're supposed to do. And then we do something different anyways. Why, why go to Him and ask if you're all just going to do what you want to do? That's what Saul does. No wonder he's desperate. So it doesn't surprise us that verse 6 tells us the Lord did not answer him. Listen, Saul is in a desperate way now. His sin had separated him from his God. He rebelled. He walked away. He turned his back on him. He is desperate. And of course, now that the conflict has come to him, he's even more desperate in this situation. He is so desperate. Listen. He is so desperate that now he's going to seek the Lord. Hear the sarcasm? But, but isn't that very similar to what we do sometimes? We have to get put in this desperate, dire situation before we we'll ever open up our hearts and say, I, I guess I need to seek the Lord now. But unfortunately for Saul, he will not find him now. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon him. Oh, if Saul would have just done that a long time ago, if Saul would even do that right now, I truly believe God would have spoken to him. God would have guided him. It may not have brought about a different situation. It may have brought the same judgment. But at least he would have sought the Lord with the truth in his heart. He's so desperate 
that look at what he does in verse 7. It says right there, seek out for me a woman who is a medium. He's wanting a necromancer. He's wanting a witch. He breaks the law of God. He breaks the law of God. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. When you come into the land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering. Anyone, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or, uh, or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. God's serious about witchcraft. He's serious about horoscopes. Amen. He's serious when it comes to these issues. Exodus chapter 22, verse 18. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. God's serious. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 27. A man or woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Upon them. God's not playing when it comes to witchcraft. He breaks the law of God. And not just that. And as it's mentioned in verse 3, he broke his own command. That they should all be banished. You can't have any contact with them. He kicked them out of the land. And Saul knew this. He knew it. Why didn't the words of Samuel come back and start ringing in his ears? Why didn't they speak to his heart and make him stop what he's about to do? Samuel said in, in chapter 15, For rebellion is as the sin of divination. God hates it. Saul is in a fit of desperation now. Listen. God will not be mocked. There will come a time when a person will push him away one time too many, and then there will be silence. I believe wholeheartedly that when God has had enough, he will take a person out of this world. He'll take an unbeliever out, but let me tell you something else. I believe he'll take a believer out. When you have just come to the point of rebelliousness to him, that you are you are bringing shame upon his name, he will remove you from this world. The sinner whom God has been reaching out to for years, I just ask you, what will you do in your day of desperation? To whom will you call on in that day when you desperately need to hear what you are called, what you are supposed to do, or you're looking for a direction? You're in a conflict. You're sick, dying, some other life-altering trial. And now you need the living God. You are there because of your own sin, your rebelliousness. God didn't make you do the things that you've done, just like he didn't make Saul do the things that he's done. You have refused the omnipotent hand of divine love reaching down to you from Calvary's cross. And oh, how much more desperate does your situation need to be before you cast yourself upon the rock of ages and be washed in Christ's blood. Listen, I just got call. I just got to tell you, if you're here this morning, or if you, if you watch this later on, I would just ask you and tell you and beg you why wait any longer? Let the hope of salvation in Christ alone crush the desperation that you're experiencing to dust. And Christian, listen, don't turn. This is what happens when we talk about this. Christians, you do this. You turn your head. You look up off to the other direction. You don't think it has anything to do with you. Listen, we find ourselves at times in the throes of desperation also. Some fall into that, that bog of desperation because of anxiety or fear or depression or worry that you're carrying around needlessly. And I will just tell you, as one who has and still does struggle with anxieties and fears, you do it to yourself. 
And I know that sounds ugly and that sounds hard, but I'm right there with you. I want you to remember that. We do it to ourselves. You allow it. I allow it. Stop! It will bring you ultimately to desperation, which we will talk about last. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 3. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. Ain't that what we want in our times of desperation? We want a peace to come over us. We want the peace of the Lord to come upon us. We want to be away from that, that desperateness that we feel. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what we want in that time of desperation? How do we get past it? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Set your mind and your heart in the direction of the Lord and that desperation will pass. And there's still yet other believers who you are in the waves of desperation because of your sin. You are in open rebellion to the Lord and His commands. You have turned away from His Word. You have turned away from His people. You have turned away from the preaching and teaching that once was your only and all hope in your life. You did that. God didn't do that. You did that. You are to blame, not Him. Oh, confess your sins this morning. Repent of them. Find forgiveness and be reconciled with your God. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You're a new creation now. Get rid of the, what the desperation is. Go wherever it wants to go, but leave you alone. 1 Corinthians 5, 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Listen, if that's you this morning... If your sin has caused this desperation in your life, be reconciled to God this morning. Be, re be reconciled to God. And guess what? That desperation will disappear because of your faithfulness to come back to Him. The next point is this. Saul is distracted and deceived. Now, I'm just going to let you know straight up front. Me and Logan even talked about this a little this morning. There are many different little rabbit holes that we can go down in this portion of our text. All of them would be sermons in and of themselves. And I'm going to stick to the theme that Saul has come to this point of no return. And what takes place in verses 7 through 19 shows that God is done with Saul and his sinful rebellion against him. I believe Saul here is at the very peak of his wickedness by the end of verse 19. So let's read verses 7 through 19. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there's a medium in Edendor. So Saul disguised himself. Boy, isn't that just like him? He can't be truthful about nothing. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, Divine for me a, by a spirit, and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying this trap for my life to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring up for me Samuel. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. He said to her, What is his appearance? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed it with his face to the ground and paid homage. Then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? 
Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophet or by dreams. Therefore I have summoned you to tell me what I shall do. And Samuel said, Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned, turned, turned from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give, you, will give Israel also with you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. Now, the first thing I want to point out goes back to verse 7, and it's the state of his servants. Listen, there is no excuse for what they did except their own wickedness. They go and they find a medium for Saul to consult. What wicked and unfaithful to God and Saul these men were. They should have said, nay, nay, no, my Lord, not on my life would I go and do this thing. That is an affront to our God. It's treason against the Most High. No, I will have no part in it. Why did they not try and talk him out of it at least? But they don't. They go and they find a witch. And personally, I think maybe... Saul's, that was Saul's intent all along. He knew the Lord wasn't going to talk to him. He knew the Lord wasn't going, to, wasn't going to speak to him. That the only hope he had was to consult spirits from the other side. So off they go in the dark of night in disguise. And isn't that a way, that you, and isn't that what you would expect from those going out to engage in wickedness? Just like Judas did. And no, and no one should see the king, their king doing it. Of all, of all people, the king. None of them should see that. And upon arrival, he tells her what he wants. Div divination. He wants one brought from the dead and promises her safety in doing so. Let the seance begin, right? That's what's fixing to happen. Now let me tell you, and this is where uh, I'm just going to ask for you, you need to go back and you need to read this real passionately. You need to go back and, and do a little bit of reading from maybe some, some of the commentators on this. Because there, there are several different thoughts on what happens next. So we ask the question, is the witch really talking with Samuel? Does she really bring up Samuel, the prophet? So the thoughts are that God allowed this rare occasion... For a witch to do this work as a way of pointing out to Saul his judgment that was at hand. The next thought is, the witch faked the whole thing and spoke by demonic influence. And then lastly, that God somehow divinely intervened himself in order to rebuke Saul. And I think all of those, and let me tell you what, there's some great men on all these different sides that have these views. And I think every one of these views is credible. It's a biblical view. But I hold to a fourth view. That Saul and the witch were speaking to a demon. Maybe, maybe even to Satan himself. And you, and you would ask, why, why do I think that? Well, here's a couple reasons. And let me tell you, each one of these reasons that I give you, there's a rebuttal to it. There's a reason why that can't be one of the reasons why we think it was a demon. First thing is, I think the witch is, is, is talking to a demon because suddenly, she doesn't know who it is before, suddenly she identifies Saul. I think it was demonically revealed to her. When, and when you start looking at all the other things, uh, I think that's when you, you understand that it was a demon who said, hey, it's Saul. Don't be fooled. The second thing is, a witch, a demon, or Satan does not have the power to bring one back from the dead or to raise the spirit of the dead. Death is final. The dead cannot return. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. What does it say? It was appointed unto man once to die, and then what? Then judgment. 
So that, that gives another really good reason why it can't be seen. Or maybe that Samuel may have never been seen by Saul in the first place. Uh, some of the commentators said that she was at probably off uh, in another area of the room, or maybe in a different room altogether, and Saul is only hearing these words that are being spoken. And here's a thought. If Saul wanted to talk to Samuel, if he wanted to see Samuel, why didn't he take the witch to Samuel's grave and summon him up there? Now it also says that uh, Samuel ascends from below. Well, if, he, if his soul was with the Lord, shouldn't that soul descend from above? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 21. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes downward. So it's a thought. And then, and again, like I said, there's, there's lots of ways you can come back at that. How about this? The real Samuel would not have acknowledged the power of the witch. Another one? If it had been the true Samuel. And this is where, and this one and, the, and, the, and one other one is where I, I place my, 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 my confidence in. If it had been the true Samuel, the first and foremost thing that he would have done right at the beginning was he would have told he would have told Saul, "You need to repent and humble yourself before the hand of the mighty God." And the last thing, I just don't think, given what is told to us about God's hatred of witchcraft and different things, I just do not believe that God would have used a witch for anything like that. And again, all of this is open to debate. You have to read it. You have to look at it. But I think here is where we see Saul is deceived in all this by the great deceiver himself. But what, but what happens next is interesting. Everything that the Samuel, whoever he may be, tells Saul, it's every bit of it is true. Saul admits in verse, in verse 15, he's distressed. He is desperate now. Saul tells the truth for one time in his life. He says, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more. Now look at what Samuel tells him. Look down there in verse 16. Samuel said, why then do you ask me since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? Yep, that's true. Because Saul acknowledged it. Verse 17, the Lord has done to you as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Yep, that's true. Verse 18. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Yep, that's true. Every bit of that's true, and Saul knew it. But what about... Well, now, stop think for a second. Now, if, now if this is a demon impersonating Samuel... Listen, he would have known all that already. It may have been one of the spirits that had been tormenting Saul from the very beginning. It wouldn't be a secret. But what about verse 19? Verse 19. Samuel says, Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hands of the Philistines. That causes a problem because would a demon have known a future event. They're not omniscient. They wouldn't have known that. Not unless, not unless God told them. And we know that He does. He God. God does use demons sometimes. In First Kings chapter 20, uh, 22 and verse twenty, and the Lord said, "Who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead?" And one said one thing, and another said another. It was a lying demon. A lying spirit that went forth. If it was the true Samuel, how would he know? He's not, he's not omniscient unless God told him. See, so we have a lot of different things that need to be considered when we look at this passage. But I want us to focus that the enemy had long ago ensnared Saul with pride and arrogance and fear and anxiety. And now that they have, have him in a, in a desperate, he's desperate now over his circumstances, now they deceive him. This Samuel uh, even deceived Saul into thinking that he and his sons would be with him in the Lord. 
Because that's one way to read it. Did Saul, did Saul hear that? That you and your sons will be with me? Well, he knew where Saul was going to be. Or he knew where Samuel was going to be. But I'll tell you right now. I don't think there's anything credible in Saul's life that points out that he was a believer. Did Saul think that he was going to be with him? No, I think it's very simple what he's, what, what he's saying there. He just means that simply you're going to be in the state of the dead. Brings up a lot of questions. But see, ever since the fall of man, Adam and Eve in the garden, <clears throat> man has been in a desperate way. Enslaved in sin, dead in sin, separated from God, objects of his wrath. How much worse can it get? Well, it does. The enemy is constantly deceiving the masses. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Oh, how many, listen, how many people there are today who in their desperate situations have been deceived by damning lies of cults and other religions and the her and heresies of the highest order. The God of this world has come as an angel of light, sounding like God, looking like God, even sometimes behaving like God, but it is not God. Not the true God, at least. Even today, there are those who are great deceivers like the witch of Endor. 2 John verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. In the flesh. Such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 13, While evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We're living this. We're living this, 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 in this place of distraction and deceit from the enemy. And oh, you who know not Christ, do not be taken in by the father of lies, that great deceiver. It is Christ alone who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. John 14, 6, the day is coming, I promise you. A day is coming when each one of us will reach a point of no return. And brothers and sisters in Christ, when you find that you are in an hour of desperation, let not your hearts be distracted and deceived. Oh, how, how the enemy waits for that weak moment. And they look for that prompt door in your heart. And he walks right in with his distractions. And he may be saying, your God is not hearing you. I'm so sorry, but, but he will not answer you. He will point you to things that look just as good, sound just as good, maybe even feel just as good. But they are clouds without water. They are bread without flour, fire without heat. It's all deceitfulness. It's all a lie. And then before you know it, you've eaten the forbidden fruit and bought into the lie and have been deceived. And Christian, Christian, please, raise up the standard of the king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the, the lamb of God. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the armor of God and fight. Fight. You are in a desperate hour Amen. for the glory of God. Stand up and fight for what you know is true. Do not be distracted. Do not be deceived. Listen, the battle is almost over for us. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Romans 13, 11. We are almost home. Do not be distracted or deceived by the enemy. Last point is this. Saul is despondent. Now that Saul has found himself in a desperate situation, he's distracted and deceived, though he don't know it. He ends up in the depths of, des of despondency. He is in despair of heart and soul now. Look at verse 20. 
Then Saul fell at full length, fell at once, full length on the ground, filled with fear because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. And the woman came to Saul, and when she saw that he was terrified, she said to him, Behold, your servant has obeyed you. I have taken my life in my hand and have listened to what you have said to me. Now, therefore, you also obey your servant. Let me set a morsel of bread before you and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he listened to their words. So he arose from the earth and sat on the bed. Now the woman had fattened a calf in the house, and she quickly killed it. And she took flour and kneaded it and baked the unleavened bread of it. And she put it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they arose and went away that night. Listen, it's like a bolt of lightning that struck Saul to the ground. His spirit is crushed. Now an even greater fear and despondency. This news he could not bear. And it laid him low in his spirit and his body dropped to the ground. He had not eaten all day. Probably because when he gazed upon the sea of Philistines come out to battle with him, he just had lost all appetite. And maybe even that his conscience now was stabbed by his guilt at all he had done. Maybe he realizes he had come to that point of no return. And listen, I don't think the witch is showing kindness in verses 21 through 25 when she says, Get up, let me make you a meal. Let me go kill the fatted calf. I think she wants to get him out of her place ASAP. She doesn't want him there anymore. She was still at risk. The king was in her house. If any should come and see this, they may put her to death. Not necessarily Saul, but somebody else. And finally, with great difficulty, the witch and Saul's servants compel him to eat. And afterwards, they depart in the darkness of the night just as they had come. Saul is desperate. He's distracted. He's deceived. And now he is in the depths of despondency, the depths of despair. Here is the man who stood head and shoulders above all others years ago. Chosen by God according to what the people wanted in a king. The man who had slain his thousands. The man consumed by pride and arrogance and jealousy and fear. The man tormented by evil spirits. The man who rebelled against the commands of God, the prophets of God, and rebelled against God himself. The man who had nearly slain all of the priestly family. The man who pursued David so vehemently all around the country to kill him. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. His day of judgment has come. He will soon fall, never to rise again. The ultimate point of no return. He had a lifetime to truly seek the Lord. In truth, with his whole heart, but didn't. He had multiple opportunities to repent and have godly sorrow, godly repentance, godly brokenness and contriteness. But he didn't. He didn't do it when desperate. He didn't do it when he was distracted and deceived. And now he will refuse to do it when he is despondent and in great despair. And we just ask, Saul, 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 why? Why? And the answer is really clear. He had no part for the living God. The day quickly approaches for the man or woman who does not know Christ as Lord and Savior. The day of, of great despondency, a day of despair. You will close your eyes in death and you will be ushered into eternity. You will not have your eyes shut for but a mere twinkling. And the despair and the agony and the torment will be upon you. You have died without Christ's blood washing you clean of your sins. You have not been clothed in His righteousness. You are now separated 
from the love and grace and mercy of the living God. His judgment has come. His wrath is upon you. The eternal hell opens its mouth wide to receive you. You are at the point of no return. I know how I pray, how I beg you this morning that you would see your desperate condition. That you would see that the enemy has distracted you and deceived you with the things in this world. That you would become so despondent, you cry out to God for His mercy and grace to save you. That you cry out in repentance of your sins, confessing them, asking for forgiveness. From your knees, you are found pleading for Jesus to be your only Lord and Savior. That you would be bathed in that fountain of Jesus' blood, washed in that blood, and clothed in His righteousness unto salvation. Oh, run to Christ even now. Do not wait until it's too late. Believers, do you find yourself in a place of despondency today? In a desperate way this morning. Have you slid back into sin? You find yourself distracted and deceived by the enemy. Oh, how despair has come upon you now. Many saints of God, listen, many saints of God have been found in the same place during conflict, trials, or tribulations. Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress was in despair many a time. And the slew of despond as he first starts out his journey. He meets despondency and despair. At the hill called Mount Sinai, where he's seeking to find salvation and works, he finds himself in, in despair and despondency. At the hill called Difficulty, when he loses the scroll of the Word of God, he finds himself in despair and despondency. In the valley of the shadow of death, despair and despondency. But his king saw him and delivered him each time. If your sin has put you here in this place of despair, in this place of despondency, confess. Repent of your sins. Ask for forgiveness. The Word of God tells us that, that forgiveness is there for us. If you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Return to Him. Be reconciled to Him. Be restored to a right relationship with Him. Matthew chapter 11, you all know this one, verses 28 through 30. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I would just ask you this morning, come now. Come now, be rid of your desperation. Be rid of of that desperation once and for all. Let the distractions and the, deceitful, the deceitfulness of this world depart and may despondency and despair be replaced with the hope and confidence of the saving power of Jesus Christ in you. Do not be a soul and understand that the point of no return quickly approaches each one of us. How will the Lord find you? Will He find you desperate? Will He find you distracted and deceived? Will He find you despondent without Christ? Or will He find you fighting and carrying on this battle against the flesh, against this world? faithfully as a servant of God. Let's pray. Father, I just ask you to let your word speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, you're our only hope. You're the only hope for those who are lost without Christ. Oh God, bring salvation to us. I ask in Christ's name. Amen.